Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me. It's an extreme pleasure to be here. And I will have an opportunity to talk about uh, electric and automated vehicles. I don't have to tell you this, but it definitely is the thing to do. You have to talk about electric and automated. If you look at the number of clips that have been appearing over the last few months, what you see is there is a continuous and very steady increase. We have the OEMs getting into the fray. We have the suppliers that are asking themselves questions. What do I need to do in order to survive in this environment? What kind of innovation? What kind of ad adjustment to my product portfolio do I need to drive? And we have even states, in particular also China, the US, getting into the fray and saying, OK, listen, how can I drive, for example, electric mobility and uh, uh, make a difference for my ecosystem, make a difference for my country? So it's definitely exciting. It is very, very important today and will be more important going forward. Good, yeah. Now, if you look at valuations, what you see is that the excitement of the street cannot be contained, right? If you compare these curves, you have, on the one hand, Daimler, and you have uh, Ford, basically very steady uh, movement in their share price, and then you have the Tesla share price that's sort of on steroids. Right, going out, I mean, up, up, up. If you look at their overall market cap, very uh, impressive vis-a-vis -vis Daimler, vis-a-vis -vis Ford. Now, mind you, Daimler and Ford are companies that have a whole ecosystem set up. Right, you have the suppliers, you have the distribution, you have all your people trained, and here we have a startup. If you look at it from a per-produced vehicle or light vehicle perspective, Tesla is 23 times as valuable as Daimler and uh, uh, 80 times as valuable as Ford. Now looking at this, there's this English expression, sort of pigs can fly. Having worked at Daimler, it sort of uh, uh, sometimes feels like they may not fly, but they're definitely studying the manuals, right? It is exciting to see the kind of uh, uh, sort of investment that's happening. Uh, definitely there's a lot of hope that is built as far into this as far as the future is concerned. In terms of regions, totally different drivers across the board. We have China with strong incentives. We have definitely also the need to address local emission in the cities. There is an issue in China. There is an issue in India. We have uh, the United States where TCO is driving the development and also to some degree large fleets like UPS and others adopting a green image to basically say, listen, we're moving in the right direction, we're moving into the future. In terms of products, the uh, overall situation is that today, as of today, we have TCO positive cases in the mid-range. If we're looking at a truck with about a 300 mile range by 2025, we believe that this will be a positive business case. The payback taking projected uh, battery cost into account will be around 42 to 60 months. So that starts making sense. Uh, if we look at uh, the kind of applications that we have, BYD with their truck has a 125 mile range. Daimler currently around 250. Tesla uh, with a projected three, I mean, a, a, a sort of announced 300 to 500 mile range. And then beyond that, you have fuel cell applications. Nikola is currently looking at 500 to about 1,000 miles as far as the application is concerned. In some instances, maybe 1,250. And then obviously the diesel truck at the uh, outer end of this uh, spectrum. Having said all this, there's a lot of excitement around electric uh, vehicles in the commercial vehicle industry, but looking at the use cases, at least from where we stand, it is unlikely that we will see a large penetration in the HD truck segment. We believe that if we're focusing on BEV only, penetrations will be low between one to about 5%. The last mile distribution in the key regions of Europe of uh, the United States and China 
It's a little bit more promising, about 10% by 2025. And the main difference or the main driver is really in bus applications. We're looking at buses in particular in China, driven by regulation, driven by the government. There will be a very significant penetration. And we do see the same happening in Europe as well. And again, driven by governments, driven also by uh, incentives. On the autonomous uh, side, the current situation is that the OEMs are working on stage three and uh, stage four technologies. A lot of startups embark, uh, or too simple in China, are getting into the fray, and we have lots of specialty providers that are uh, uh, developing technologies that will enable and do enable automated uh, uh, driving. If we look at the overall cost, in a little bit, uh, what we'll see is today we are in confined areas. We're looking at controlled environments. This is harbor terminals, mining operations, large production sites, large agricultural farms. And we do believe that by 2025 and beyond, we should see the first transfer hub applications, meaning applications where we take a truck with a driver to a hub. We have an automated vehicle driving it from A to B, and then we pick up the load at the end point. Cost-wise, this is a calculation, just an example calculation that we've done for the United States. What we see is if we consider the transport uh, with about a 25-mile drayage from pickup to uh, transfer hub and then another 25 in the destination from the transfer hub to the final location, cost-wise, it does have a major impact. If we look at it on cost per load, it's about a 40% improvement in cost due to the fact that we don't have a driver for the 1,000 mile journey between the transfer hubs and in terms of time, and uh, it's basically an advantage because the autonomous truck can simply run 24-7. Uh, from a fleet perspective, the impact is moderate. We've done a, a simulation here assuming that the Sunbelt states that are currently partial towards autonomous driving would allow autonomous transport. If you take that as uh, the overall assumption, what you see is normally uh, the fleet would go from 3.1 to 4.1 million units with uh, the modification of autonomous driving in these uh, states, it would still grow to about 3.9 million units. So there is no collapse of the market due to autonomous technology. The only thing that we see is a shift from uh, tractor sleeper caps to autonomous vehicles. In terms of applications, we have different sweet, pot, sweet spots for autonomous cars uh, and for autonomous trucks and for uh, electric applications. Long haul, regional line haul is typically your application for autonomous vehicles to some degree, also yard operations. Electric currently short range, we're looking at inner city distribution, we're looking at drayage and yard applications. With that, uh, summing it up, I think the, um, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of work that's happening in electric and in autonomous, uh, driven by climate change. The pressure to be zero or carbon neutral as far as transportation and logistics is concerned is massive. That pressure will not go away. Uh, artificial intelligence is also real. So it's not a question of if we have to change, it's a question of how we need to change and what we need to do and when we need to do it. The timelines for this change will simply vary as a function of location, as a function of region. Uh, but overall, diesel has a lot of time left. It's not that diesel is gonna die out. I had a discussion with a friend of mine uh, when uh, India made the announcement that by 2030, they wanted to be completely electric vehicle uh, driven. Some of his joint venture partners were asking, listen, should we still invest in factories? That is uh, probably uh, pushing it a little too far. The, uh, uh, you need a focused innovation strategy, but again, diesel will remain for a long time and we will also need truck drivers going forward. With that, I'd like to thank you very much.